In this lesson, what we're going to be doing is taking a quick crash course into Maya. Now, let me tell you what. This can be very overwhelming. Maya is a very big and very powerful application. Isn't that right, Logan? Oh, yes, most definitely. Now, I will go ahead and point this out. You guys do have the Maya PLE that comes on disc number three with Unreal Tournament 2003 when you go out and purchase the game. Right now, we're not working with the PLE itself for the simple fact that, well, you'd have watermarks all over the screen, and that's going to make things a little bit difficult to look at while we're working uh, in this particular lesson. I will point out that in some of the later lessons, we will be using the PLE because that's what the plugin was created for for exporting your geometry straight from Maya over into Unreal Ed. Now, Maya is a powerful, very powerful application, like I said a second ago, and it is very rich with features. What you're about to see is a quick overview of some of the technology and some of the features and where things are more or less laid out. This is not designed to be a show-all, teach-all type lesson right here. That would be Pretty impossible to do. Wouldn't you agree, Logan? Oh, yeah. That would take a while. <laughs> yeah. And could be very painful for us. Now, we will be coming back to Maya several more times throughout this VTM and adding on to what you've seen already. If you are already a Maya user, this section right here will probably put you to sleep if it has not already. So I'm just giving you that as a warning. For those of you guys, again, that are completely new to Maya and perhaps completely new to working in a 3D application outside of Unreal Ed, this lesson may scare you. That's okay. Watch it again, and again, and yet again. And then you may start to feel a little bit better. Now, let's go ahead and start talking about Maya. First of all, this is how it looks when you first start it up. Now, of course, if you're running the PLE, you're going to have watermarks all over the screen. Now, I will say this. PLE is absolutely cool. It's Alias Wavefront's way of basically letting all of the hobbyists out there, all of the the you know the young students in high school still, or perhaps even younger than high school, that want to get their hands kind of dirty working with a 3D application as powerful as Maya, but they don't have thousands of dollars to sink in the application itself. So what they've done is they've made the PLE available, the Personal Learning Edition, so that people can do just that. Pretty smart, eh, Logan? Oh, yeah. It's easy way to get lots of people into the whole workflow and technology of Maya. Exactly. So, uh, so with that, now let's go ahead and start talking about Maya. All right. Right now we're looking at a viewport. This is a giant viewport. What I'm going to do with my mouse over the viewport right now, I'm going to hit my space bar. I'm just going to tap it. Now I'm looking at a more standardized four uh, viewport, as you see here, layout. Uh, a lot of you guys may be familiar with inside of Unreal Ed. We've got a combination of orthographic and perspective views, again, just like inside of Unreal Ed. We've got a top view, a front view, a side view, and a perspective view. We'll be doing a lot of work inside these. Let me go ahead and spend just a second and show you how we can go about navigating inside these viewports, since obviously that's going to be pretty important, knowing how to get around to look at, let's say, the other side of your model as you're trying to model. All right, to do this, to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm simply going to click on the sphere right here, which will put a sphere in the scene. Now you can see my sphere is a long ways away, so what I want to do is go ahead and zoom up on it. So I'm going to hold Alt down on the keyboard, and while holding Alt down, I'm going to press the left and the middle mouse button. All right, and both of them pressed, I'm going to slide my mouse. You notice as I slide it left or right, as I slide it to the right, I zoom in on it. Okay. Is that pretty simple, Logan? So, yeah. You got a little bit of a key combination there, but once you get it down, it's really cool because it gives you very fine control. You notice how he was smo smoothly zooming in and out. Like such. All right. So, again, that's Alt, Left, and the Middle Mouse button. By the way, if you right now are watching this saying, but my mouse only has two buttons, well, my advice is go buy another mouse. There is a very painful workaround, and we're not going to go into that. I mean, there is, of course, ways of going up and telling the camera that you want to dolly or you want to rotate or whatever, but no, we're not going to be covering that. Go buy a new mouse. All right, so next thing I want to do. If I want to, let's say, pan around, I can hold Alt down on the keyboard, press the middle mouse button down by itself, and now I am panning around. Pretty simple. Okay, this will work in all of these viewports. Okay, zooming in, Alt, left, and middle, same thing. Okay, oh, a little too far there. Now, if I want to rotate around in my perspective view, I can hold Alt down, and I can rotate around the view. I can rotate back this way as well, over and underneath. Simple enough. But if you were to come over into an orthographic viewport, hold Alt down and try to rotate, you'll notice you get a no entry sign, if you will. You can't do that, okay? 
only in your perspective view. So there's your navigation key combinations, or I guess we could say key slash mouse combinations required for manipulating these viewports. Now, viewports, you've got an active one. It's the one that's got this dark blue border around it. Let me point this out real quick. In some applications, you guys know that you must click on a particular viewport before you do an operation in that viewport. Well, Maya is really cool as far as viewports are concerned when it comes to the viewport's recognizing where the mouse is at all times. In other words, if I want my top view to go full screen right now, I could simply tap the space bar, and I've now maximized that viewport. Tap the space bar again, and it goes back down. If I move my mouse down here to my side viewport, I do not have to activate this viewport before enlarging it. If I go ahead and tap the space bar, check it out, side, it knows to go ahead and enlarge the viewport that the mouse was over at the time, the mouse pointer that is. Okay, so here we are front. You get the idea. So this is very cool. Hold Alt, put my mouse up here in perspective, click, drag, automatically makes it active. There you go. Another thing to point out, all of these viewports by default have all got a little menu bar at the top where you can come in and there's different things that you can do. If I wanted to come into shading right now and say smooth shade all, so perhaps I want to see this in a shaded fashion. Come back up here, maybe I want to see it flat shading, or maybe I want to see just a bounding box because I've got a very slow machine or a slow graphics card, or let's go ahead and come back over to wireframe view. All right, let's go ahead and quickly talk about the hotkeys. I'm just kind of getting the viewport area out of the way because it's, of course, the main area you're going to be working no matter what you're doing inside of Maya. So go ahead and hit 4 to show a wireframe, 5 will show you shade it. Six, if you have textures applied, you'll see the textures. And seven will show you what the object looks like as best the viewport can by, illum by the illumination that's been added to your scene. Right now, there is no illumination in our scene. In other words, we haven't added no lights. That's why right now you're seeing your sphere completely black. So I'll go ahead and hit four again, and we're now back to a wireframe view. I will say one last thing, then we'll start taking our little trip around the UI. And that is, notice how right now it looks like a real pretty sphere, but the moment I hit five for a shaded view, Logan, does that look like a nice rounded sphere? No, it looks pretty edgy. looks very edgy. <laughs> it's a sphere on edge. Okay, So let's see if we can relax this guy a little bit. This is a NURBS sphere. That means that we have the ability to display it in our viewports three different ways, in a rough state, in a medium state, and in a fine state. Right now, we are seeing this in a rough state. And by viewing it in a rough state, that doesn't mean it would render out like this. But what that does is it allows the viewport to be fast because there's not as much detail that it has to calculate. If I press 2 on the keyboard, now check, or take a look at that. Check that out. It's a little bit bit finer. Right, you start to see more of the volume that it would really fill out. Exactly, but it's still got some pretty long segmented edges in there. And if I hit three on the keyboard, now it's starting to look pretty smooth, starting to like that, definitely looks a lot more like a sphere. But take a look at what's going on down here, a lot more detail that we're worried about calculating at the moment, and you know, it's going to slow things down. So I'll just go ahead and hit one. That's going to simply take it back into a rough state. And if we're viewing things shaded, that's the only place you're going to see you know, the difference. Of course, if we're dealing with wireframe, as you see here, hit four, it looks nice and round. Okay? So, <clears throat> Logan, that just gives us a quick overview of the panels and how, or actually, let's go ahead and say this real quick because I said panels. I'd and that say could, that. Yeah, that could kind of mess some people up. You guys are going to hear me refer to these as viewports for the simple fact that that is kind of an interchangeable word with just about all 3D applications and Unreal Ed as well. You say viewport, somebody knows what you're talking about. But inside of Maya, the correct term for these are view panels. Uh, everything that you work with inside of Maya, for the most part, when we start getting into the different utility windows, are known as panels. And the panels can be docked or they can be floating. Right now, if I came up to panel and I came down here to panel, I could actually change this to a bunch of different types of panels that are available, different types of utilities if you want to look at it that way. So I just wanted to take just a second and say that if you hear me kind of slip up and say the word panel. Yeah, basically a panel. Uh, these four panels that we were looking at are just panels panels that are drawing uh, a view of your scene. Exactly. Which is why we call them view panels. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead now and take our attention away from our view panels, take them up here to the top. 
Start out with a menu bar. Okay, well, almost every application, of course, has got a menu bar. The menu bar gives you access to everything from common things, such as a new scene, opening a scene, saving a scene, etc., into more complex things, such as edit membership tool, create blend shape, weird, funky things like this. Um, one of the important things, though, to point out about this menu bar is that it is dynamic in a sense. Basically, there are... So many features inside of Maya, so many different things that you can do that Alias Wavefront took the time to go in there and categorize all of these things into four different what are called menu sets. And we can see these by clicking on this little drop down right here. You can see we've got animation, modeling, dynamics, and rendering. And watch how this works. See how I've got file, edit, modify, create, display window. These options are always going to stay. Help is always going to stay, but everything between window and help is going to change depending on what menu set we're in. Right now we're in a modeling menu set. It's modeling things. If I come down here and switch to dynamics, dynamic related things, okay? So rendering related things, you get the idea. Now, of course, when dealing with static meshes, where are you going to be working most of the time, Logan? Well, we're probably going to be wanting to model static meshes. You so. got it. You'll be working with modeling. So <laughs> just thought I'd point that out real quick. Okay, you can also use F2, F3, F4, and F5 on your keyboard as shortcut keys for switching between the different menu sets that are available. All right, moving on from menu sets down this next area right here, very long toolbar, if you will, or bar full of icons. This is all called your status bar right here. Now, quickly, let's just go ahead and hit some of the main areas. Of course, this very first drop-down right here allows me to change between my different menu sets, as I showed just a second ago. Next three icons over next to it allow us to create a new scene, open up a scene, or save a scene. You'll notice between these different category areas that we've got this straight line right here, this little bar thing in the middle. This allows us to do is basically show and hide these sections, okay, like such which can be kind of convenient if you're working in a lower resolution and you're wanting to hide some of these things so that you can see some things that are hidden further on down. All right, moving on over. Now over in this large area right here, we're going to start getting into basically what mode are we in and what are we allowed to select and not select while we're working in our scene. Right now, this first drop down allows us to go in and set specific filters. So let's say I want to only want to be able to select things that are polygon related, I can no longer select this guy right here, but if I had created a polygon primitive, let's say a cube, and let's go ahead and take just a second and move him out to the side and scale him up, okay, good enough, I'll deselect him, I can't select my NURB sphere, but I can indeed select my polygon, in fact right now I'm actually selecting it in a component mode, which we'll talk about in just a second, so let's go ahead and go back over to objects, okay, so we're in objects, so basically these are all different types of filters that you can use, moving over these three icons are going to end up playing an important role while you're developing a scene, we're not going to really get into the first one right now, which deals with hierarchical type selections, but these first, or these second two are very important, object selection means that we're in an object state and everything that we select is going to be just that, an object. If we want to, we could come into a component state, and working in components, now look at this. I'm actually selecting points, so if I start manipulating those points, now we're modeling something, okay? So I'm now working with the components that make up that polygon cube in this particular case. You'll notice as I switch between object, component, and even over here in this mode here as well, which is for templates and hierarchies, etc. You'll notice that all of these icons over here are changing. Well, these icons represent your pick masks, okay? In other words, what you can pick and what you cannot pick. So in other words, right now, if I come over here, I can select a NURB sphere, and I can also select my polygon cube. But if I was to come up here and turn off, let's say, surfaces, okay, so I just simply clicked it. The button is now turned off. Now take a look. Okay, go ahead. I cannot select. I cannot select, but if I had created a light, let's say a spotlight, so there's a spotlight in the scene, and let's go ahead and select our move tool and move it on over to the side. Let me deselect it real quick to show this. I can select my light, I just can't select surfaces. These are pick masks. Pick masks are very valuable, but one of the things I always tell students is this. When you're new to Maya and you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to select something and you cannot select it, please make it a habit to immediately move your eyes up here to your pick masks and make sure nothing is set wrong. 
Now, in learning your pick masks at first, of course, because you're not going to know all these icons when you first use Maya, you will find it very helpful to note that the tooltip that pops up as you move your mouse over each of these will tell you the particular pick mask type that it is. Like right here, you can see where it says joints. Right here, it's curves. Here, it's surfaces. And what's really nice is some of these allow you to fine-tune even further. In other words, right now, I turned off surfaces. I cannot select polygon surfaces, and I cannot select nerve surfaces. But what if I wanted to be able to select nerve surfaces and any other surface type, but I did not want to be able to select polygons? Well, I could simply right-click on surfaces. Take a look at that. Pretty cool, eh? Oh, yeah. I could simply come down here and say, I don't want polygon surfaces, so I can click it like that. Notice my icon now has the color orange, indicating that... Basically, it's a combination of things I can and cannot select has been set up underneath this. If I come over here, I can select my polygon sphere, but I cannot select, did I say polygon sphere? Let's say <laughs> NURBS sphere. I caught myself on that. Sorry about that. So I can select my NURBS sphere, but I cannot select my polygon cube. Okay? So let's go ahead and turn that off and back on. Pick masks are very important. Okay, so... Moving on down, I'm going to start skipping a few things because they're not relevant to this particular VTM. But I'm going to jump down here to this area, snap to grid. Obviously, grid snapping plays a very important role. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yes, of course. If you want to, uh, once you get your grid set up, of course, you're going to want to build pieces, uh, build your static meshes so that they'll snap to the grid once you're in under lead, which will, of course, make... Uh, snapping, like, say, a walkway together, make that actually uh, possible. Exactly, exactly. When we're working inside of Unreal Ed, snapping becomes extremely critical. Brushes with static meshes, etc. It's just a good idea to use it. And if you respect your grid settings inside of Maya and you know the difference between Maya's grid settings and Unreal Ed grid, grid setting, which we'll actually talk about a little bit later on, and then make sure that while you're actually modeling stuff out that you come in here and you turn your grid snaps on, and you're going to be in pretty good pretty good shape. Now, take a look at this. Let's go ahead and come in here. I'm going to tap space bar right now. With this turned off, I can come in here and freely drag my sphere anywhere I want. I'm going to go ahead and hit Control-Z to undo that. But if I turn grid snaps on, and now I come in here, look at this. Snap, 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 snap. So I get it snapped right to the proper location. Now, we'll talk more about snaps a little bit later on. I just wanted you to understand the basic concept that we are snapping to a grid here. But there are different types of snaps available. Grid snaps, we've got curve snaps, we've got point snaps, we've got uh, view plane snaps as well. All right, moving on down a little bit further. Actually, Logan, to be honest with you, I think that's everything I want to cover. I don't really want to talk about these in this particular crash course because they're not relevant at all. All right, moving down, the next thing we'll find, this large area right here is known as the shelf. The shelf is an area that we can place icons that represent options that are buried up underneath these menus at the top, and it's a way of speeding us up. In other words, let's say I want to, I want to add something over here. Let's say I want to add a polygon torus, okay? So normally you'd come up to create, you'd go down to polygon primitives, and then from there you'd have to come over here and come down to torus, all right? And then you can click it and it'll be in the scene. Now watch this. To add it over here, I'll simply hold Shift, Control, Alt. I'll come up to Create. From there, I will simply come down to Polygon Primitives. I am still holding the three buttons down on the keyboard. Now I'll come down and select Taurus, and Taurus will appear on my shelf, not in my scene. But if I click it now, take a look at that. It now actually adds it into the scene. Simple enough? Oh, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and delete that. And now let's get rid of our Taurus here because I don't want to leave it up on my shelf. All I need to do is simply middle-click and drag it all the way over here to the garbage can, let go, and it is gone. Now, let me point this out. You have the ability to set your shelf up so that you have actual, you actually have multiple shelves. And right now, you can come up here. There's a little tab icon right here. We can click it, and you can see that I've got three shelves available, shelf one, shelf two, and a NURBS primitive shelf. Okay, so we can go ahead and switch back. You can click on this little drop-down right here, and there are a bunch of other things that you can explore a little bit later on as you're becoming more and more familiar with Maya. Uh, here's how you can create new shelves and delete shelves. I will point that out real fast. So there's a quick overview of shelves. Now, moving over here, we get over to the channel box. And this is where we get into a spot. Actually, you know what, Logan? I'm going to leave this more towards last. Watch this. We're going to do this. Let's go over here to the left-hand side. I got an idea, because what happens when we start talking about the channel box and all, um, I have to get involved in a conversation 
dealing with nodes and attributes. We've got to bring the hypergraph in. We start talking about all these different things. And at that point, the intensity of this little crash course significantly increases, right? Right. We need to get, like, what's under the hood in Maya. Exactly. So before I hit this, let's, hopefully none of our viewers out there are breathing really fast. Let's go ahead and keep this simple. Let's go ahead and go over here to the left-hand side first. So over here on the left-hand side, this is our toolbar. Very simple to use. Basically, this first section right here allows us to go in there and do very easy things, such as simply select. With select activated at the moment, let's spend just a second and talk about different ways that we can do selecting. I'll go ahead and hold Alt, Left, and Middle Mouse to zoom in a little bit. Now, left click, left click, simple enough. I can left click, hold, and marquee select, simple enough. I can select one object, hold Shift, and add another object to it. Shift is actually a toggle. In other words, while I'm still holding Shift down, I can toggle that unselected. And now, again, with Shift down and I marquee select over this entire thing, I am going to toggle the selection. So he becomes selected, and this guy becomes deselected. Okay, this right here is going to give us just a freeform lasso type drawing out selection. Moving on down, we now get into our move rotate and scale. Notice with each of these we get different visual indicators that we can work with. These are called manipulators. In fact, we're dealing with a translate manipulator, a rotate manipulator, and a scale manipulator. Very simple how these work. Right now I've got translate selected. I can simply come down here, click on the yellow box, freely drag this guy around, or if I needed to lock him to a particular axis, I could simply click on the red axis handle and drag it in X. If I want it to go in Z, you get the idea? Pretty simple. If I want to go back here and move it around freely in both X and Z, I can simply click on the middle again so that it's yellow. All right, rotate. Same thing. In fact, let's go ahead and let's do it like this. And I'm going to hit 5 on the keyboard so that I can go into a shaded view. Now, rotating, well, I can just come in here and pick which one of these axes I want to rotate it on and then simply click and drag on that particular ring and all is good. And I can also rotate perpendicular to the camera by selecting this one out here and rotate X, Y, and Z are all changing. Okay, very simple. Scaling with scale, again, I get a manipulator. I have the ability to uniformly scale it by clicking in the middle and dragging, like such. Or I can non-uniformly scale it by grabbing on one of these boxes, the red, the green, or the blue. Let's do a control Z there to drag in that particular way. Pretty simple, Logan? All right, so far, so it's basically just uh, the manipulator is what gives you the control you need to manipulate your objects. You got it. And then we've got um, a show manipulator tool right here. Mm, not really, uh, yeah, let's just not get into that. This could become kind of confusing. It'd be, this, this basically shows customized manipulators that come available with different things for visually manipulating parameters. There you go. All right, different operations you can do might have a specialized uh, manipulator. Exactly. All right, then beneath it, basically, we have different configurations that we can quickly throw Maya into. Right now, we're looking at a single perspective view. I can click. There's a real quick four view. Remember how we, I was talking about these are panels, and you can have different panels in them earlier? Take a look at this. Now we've got a perspective and an outliner. We can... Here's a perspective and a graph editor in case you're in there doing animation work. There's all sorts of different things available, which is really cool. Though I will point this out. Beginners get stuck with this all the time. Be careful. If you were to come up here to Window on your menu bar at the top and open something up like, let's say, Outliner. Okay, so I've got my Outliner open. And then I wanted to come over here and put myself in a configuration that's got Outliner docked on the left and my perspective on the right. Look at this. I've got something else over here as opposed to the outliner. The reason is my outliner is already open. So you already had your outliner tied up in a floating window. You got it. So you need to make sure that that guy is closed so that that will actually work. So it couldn't grab the outliner from that floating window. Nope. So it had to go just grab the next thing down. Basically. Exactly. And often I've, I've had students that will open up like the outliner or some other thing, and they'll minimize it down here to the bottom, and then they just, they'll just they have forgotten it, and they'll be like, hey, wait a minute, Buzz, why isn't this working? Yeah, you should have seen how many windows I used to run with it uh, open. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, that's basically how we can go down here and we can use this. You'll also notice we have some buttons down here at the bottom, and these just represent the four panels that are open, and it's a quick way to come in here and say, you know, I want to take my side panel down here, and I want to take that panel, and let's change it over to a different camera view, an outliner, graph editor, dope sheet, tracks editor, it doesn't matter, whatever, one of these things, let's just pick one real quick, a graph editor, and now we have a graph editor. So if you had an idea of how you wanted your four views set up, you could just go to those four little drop downs real quickly in that one area, set them all up. You got it. And Maya's very customizable. You can go in there and 
rearrange this guy in all sorts of different configurations and save it out as well. We're not going to get into that, of course, but I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so moving on down to the bottom, what we've got down here is animation stuff. Uh, right now you're looking at a timeline. You can see what frame we're on at the moment. Of course, as far as the static mesh VTM is concerned, we're not going to be animating anything. It's all about modeling and texturing. Underneath that, we've got our range slider and our range line down here. This is just where we can define a specific range of animation that we're going to work with, as well as the entire animation length. Up underneath that, we've got our command line down here where we can come in and type mel commands. And we'll be using this a little bit later on. Over here to the right-hand side, we've got our command feedback bar. This is just going to give information back to you as you do different things throughout the scene or if there's any errors. Or in this case, we actually have a warning where it says, Warning, can't use outliner. Panel is torn off. This warning actually came from... A back, second ago. Back when I was trying to grab the, the outliner from that floating ding, window ding, ding, into ding, the ding. panel. It couldn't. You got it. All right, and then a few more things to talk about real quick. Uh, we've got some simple uh, transport controls over here, you know, simple play forwards, play backwards, um, go to the end, go to the beginning, etc. Up underneath it down here, we've got character sets, not relevant for this VTM. Our auto key feature. Uh, we've got animation preferences. We can open up the script editor by clicking this icon right here. Script editor is broke up into two areas. The only reason I'm pointing this out now is because we're actually going to create a Mel script later on in this VTM that will be pretty interesting. It's also going to be some very advanced stuff for some of you guys out there, but it's still cool just to have the video lesson so that you can come back to it later on in time, perhaps if you've taken an interest in the Mel and you've looked at some tutorials on the Internet, etc. So two, two panes. Basically, the top part is our history pane. The bottom part is our input pane. We can type down here. We can paste code in down here. And we get results back up here in the history section. So that's the script editor. All right, so very bottom down here, we've got our helpline. Basically, you'll notice as I move my mouse around the screen, the helpline is updating with different information down there. It's just a way of giving a beginner into Maya you know, some sort of clue as to what's going on or what's expected for a particular tool or operation, etc. Okay? So, whew. This brings us over here. This is where we need to kind of break off for just a second and start talking about the Maya architecture because this is pretty important. In some applications, when you create a sphere, a sphere is a sphere is a sphere, period. Okay, There's nothing fancy about it. But Maya can be said to be a system that is composed of nodes with attributes that are connected. Okay, Everything inside of Maya is a node. And every node has got attributes of some sort. And by taking these attributes and connecting them to attributes of other nodes, basically we can start data flowing from one node to the next. And this, in the end, results in some sort of a scene, an animation, a texture, a model, etc. Let's go ahead and focus on, I'm going to delete, hit the delete key to delete that one guy out. I've got a very simple, let's get rid of the light too. I've got a very simple sphere in my scene right now. This sphere is actually made up of multiple nodes. Isn't that right, Logan? Yes, it is. We've got a transform node, a shape node, and an input node. Now, if we come over here, I'm going to drag this little splitter bar down. This section is known as the channel box. The channel box is going to show nodes available along with attributes. Now, it's not going to show you all attributes. It's only going to show you keyable attributes. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Right now, I'm looking at the word NURBSphere1, which is the name of the transform node for this object. If you're going to name an object, which, of course, it's a very good idea to do that while working in a scene, you will be changing the name of the transform object itself, or transform node, excuse me. So if I wanted to call this guy my ball, I would type it right there. This object is now known as my ball, when in essence, what I really just did was named its transform node. Now, how do I know its transform node? Well, first of all, transform node's always at the top when you select an object. Second of all, look at the parameters, or let's start saying attributes, that are available for my ball. Translate X, translate Y, translate Z, rotates, scales. This is all things that are related to transformations, where the object's located, and positioned, or situated in your scene, right? Yes. Okay. Up underneath it, you see we've got shape, okay? And up underneath that, we've got make nerve sphere one. Well, to kind of show you how all this ties together, what I need to do is go up and open up a window called the hypergraph. So I'm going to come up here to Window. This is where you'll find all the different windows that you can open. And I'm simply going to come down to Hypergraph. And here's my Hypergraph. 
<coughs> excuse me, what the hypergraph does is it shows a visual representation of your scene. But it actually has another type of graph that it will show as well. So the first graph, the default graph the hypergraph shows when you pull it up, is known as the scene hierarchy graph. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to stretch that out a little bit. I'm going to hold Alt, middle mouse, and pan. So you'll notice the basic navigation keys I showed you back here apply inside my different panels as well. Okay, I can see a series of nodes, my perspective camera, my top camera, my front camera. As I select these, you'll notice that they are loading up in my channel box over on the side. Now let's go ahead and come back in here and select my ball. My ball is selected, turns green back here. If I deselect here, it deselects there. Channel box is empty because nothing is selected. Let's go ahead and select my ball. All right, now we're looking at all the attributes. Again, this is the scene hierarchy, scene hierarchy graph. And it's showing just all of our transform nodes and any sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, hierarchies, there we go, that we've got created. In other words, any parent and children relationships. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you the dependency graph for him. And to get to this, I'll come up here to the toolbar. This is the scene hierarchy graph, which is by default what we're looking at. This is the show up and downstream connections or the dependency graph. So I'll go ahead and click on this. There you go. We're now looking at a dependency graph. And we've got several different nodes over here. We've got the Make NURB Sphere 1 node. Look at this. Inputs. Make NURB Sphere 1. Let's click on that guy. By clicking on him, he just turned yellow there. And I see some attributes over here. Mm, some pretty common attributes if you think about it, right, Logan? A radius. Radius of 1.5. Enter. Well, what just happened is I changed an attribute on the Make NURB Sphere node, which is an input node. All of this data gets sent over through a connection, here's the connection, over to my ball. My ball is a shape node. When I select it, look at this, there are no attributes available over here. Of course not. The shape node simply is responsible for the construction and placement of all of the components that make this guy up. In other words, all of the CVs in this particular case. Then the final shape is passed out of here over to initial shading group. The initial shading group is in charge of basically taking the paint in the scene that is supposed to be painting an object and applying it to the surface that's coming in. That's how we're able to see this guy shade it, because right now he actually has a Lambert material applied to him. And finally, this guy just kind of sits out by himself, my ball. He is the actual transform node. He's not receiving any information. In. He just kind of governs the entire object. Okay. Now, you'll notice as I went through selecting these different nodes, some had parameters over here, some did not. As I said at the very beginning, the channel box only shows keyable attributes, attributes that we can keyframe. Now, does this mean that these other nodes have no attributes at all? No, of course not. All of these nodes have attributes. How do we go about seeing these attributes? It's very simple. All we need to do is come up to Window and come down and open up Attribute Editor. Okay, so there's the Attribute Editor. Now, look at this. Let's go back over here to My Ball. Translate X, Y, Z. Translate X, Y, Z. I can prove to you that this is Z. Let's come over to Z and type a 2 in. And you see a 2 right there as well. Simple enough. Let's go ahead and type that back to 0 now. Rotates, Scale, Shear. Ooh, there's no shear over here. Rotate Order. Well, there's no Rotate Order over here. Of course not. These things are not keyable. Okay. Does this make sense, Logan? Right. So basically you have, uh, if you want to think of attributes or settings, you have a lot of stuff you can do, but not all of that's set to be keyable because that would get in your way once you're trying to That's right. An animator is not going to be animating a rotate order or rotate axes. Uh, if we come in here and we start opening up pivots, local space, world space, limit information, there are so many different attributes generally associated with something. I mean, even if we come over here to the shape node, even the shape node that we clicked on earlier, my ball shape, Look at this. No attributes, but look at this. My ball shape, there's all sorts of different things available for them. So as you just said, if all of these things were showing up in the channel box, well, this guy would become quite difficult to navigate, and it would also make the animation process easier. Of course, animation is not our primary concern, but I have to bring it up now because it plays an important role with things that you can and cannot see. Does that make sense? Yes, I mean, you may, may, you'll need the attribute editor to see stuff because some of the stuff we might be setting might not show up in the channel box. Exactly. So you have to grab the attribute editor. Very good. All right, so another thing to go ahead and point out, you'll notice that as I select 
uh, different objects in my hypergraph or in my scene, it doesn't matter where I select them from, that my attribute editor updates automatically, and so does my channel box as well. So select, it just updated, it just updated. Let's go ahead and come back over to my ball. Again, it just updated, it just updated. So all this stuff constantly stays tied together with one another, which is really cool. Okay, so one last thing to point out about the attribute editor before I close it. You saw over here how we have multiple nodes associated. Well, inside the attribute, we can also get to the multiple nodes by coming in here and clicking on the different tabs at the top of the attribute editor. Each of these tabs represent each of those different nodes. Okay, so let's go ahead and close the attribute editor. A side note, Control A will bring up the attribute editor. So, Logan, does it kind of make sense why I introduced the hypergraph? Right, I mean... Because you can't just think of this, you're looking at the sphere that you can see in the scene, but I mean, you can't just think of it as a sphere by itself. The way Maya works is it actually takes in different nodes, and all those have to feed through each other to get a final result. Like, I mean, you started way back with the input node where you specified how many, like, uh, like it's, what its radius was. Mm -hmm. But then that had to take that information, so just a bunch of numbers, basically, and then feed that into a different node that said it was supposed to it would take those numbers and build surfaces in various locations depending on those numbers. Absolutely. Then that had to go in and Side, like how it's actually going to be seen if through a viewport or, or uh, the renderer okay. and the shading group. And then finally, that had to feed to a transform node so you could take this, what we've got so far, and where are we going to put it in the scene. Exactly. Where is it going to be positioned in the world? That's fantastic. You're absolutely right. So that's the hypergraph. Hypergraph is going to become a very important element to all of you guys out there that are completely new to working with Maya. So don't be shy to go in there and take a look at it. Don't forget, though, big thing scene hierarchy graph dependency graph. If you end up getting yourself lost, like such, all you need to do is hit A and that will frame all. Or you can hit F if you wanted to frame one thing up like I just did there. Okay? So let's see. Let's go ahead and close the hypergraph down. Uh, let's see. I think there's only one real thing left that I want to talk about, Logan, real fast. And that is I do want to bring everybody's attention up here. Well, actually, before I go to create, let's go ahead and finish off over here. One last thing. Up underneath the channel box over here, we have got basically our layers. Layers are just like in Photoshop how you can create layers and you can keep things on different layers. Same thing applies over here. If I want to create a new layer, I can simply create a new layer like such. If I wanted to, let's say, add this sphere to this layer, I could right-click on layer one. I could come down here to add selected objects. My object has now been added into layer one. As a matter of fact, if you look up here on the channel box, layer one actually appears as a node now on inputs because layer one actually is a node, which is pretty cool. Now I can come down here and I can put as many objects as I want in there. Layers are excellent to help quickly organize a scene. I can now come in here and toggle visibility off quickly, toggle visibility back on. I can template it. I can reference it. Basically, templating allows you to go in there and keep it to where it's always wireframe, even if you're viewing shade it, but you cannot select it. This is very helpful while you're modeling and you want to make certain things uh, set up so that you cannot accidentally select them to deselect what you're currently working on. Referencing, oops, let's go ahead and turn that back on. Referencing also keeps it so that you cannot select the object, but you can snap to it and you can see it shaded which is very handy. And then we'll just go ahead and go back over here to a, uh, to a regular mode like such. All right, so that's working with layers down below. All right, so, fine. oh, yeah, let's go ahead and point out real quick that you can also double-click on layers and change their name. You can also change the color so the wireframe color will be different. You get the idea. So let's go ahead and close that. I think that's good enough for a crash course anyways. And let's go ahead and wrap this up now by saying those of you guys that are new are going to obviously want to get in here and start playing. Take your attention up here to the Create Bar. From up underneath the Create Bar, you guys saw earlier that I can come up under these different categories. I kept going up under Polygon. I can create things from here. I can come up here to NURBS. I can create things that are NURBS related, like if I wanted to create a plane, and then I perhaps want to scale that plane up now. So you can now see that I've got a plane available over here. I can move this guy over. Now, let's say I want to turn my grid off. I can come up here to show. I can come all the way down, turn my grid off. Makes things a little bit easier. I can grab move. I can now move this guy down. It's just kind of a quick workflow real fast. Come select this guy, hit three. So now he's shaded in the whole nine yards. That looks nice and round. Okay? So don't forget, come up here to create. Start getting comfortable with the different things that you can go up here and create. There's a lot of different things. And right now, me getting into those would just, well... So that's not the idea of this particular lesson. All right. I just uh, had one thing I thought of. Uh, mm -hmm. While we're speaking of workflow, you might just mention the, uh, the little shortcuts for your different uh, manipulators. Select, okay. move, Absolutely. Rotate. Absolutely. Right now, if you hit Q, that'll bring just regular select. Uh, if we hit W, that is our move. 
uh, trans, or excuse me, translate manipulator. E rotation manipulator. R scale manipulator. So, say as you can see the icon on the left side, how it gets selected. So it's the same thing yeah. as clicking on it. It's just a very it's a quick access to it. Absolutely. All right. So again, this is designed just to be a quick crash course into the whole layout of Maya. That's all. Just the layout of Maya. This is not designed to get you up and running with Maya in such a way that you're going to be creating unbelievable characters that are going to be rigged, animated, walking, talking, all that good stuff. You can do all that, Maya. Maya, you can do an entire animated movie inside of Maya. It wouldn't be the first time. Maya is an extremely powerful and capable application. But what, we're, what we've done right here is just presented enough that you should be able to go in there and not be completely lost. Be able to at least manipulate around, have a basic understanding of some of the underlying architecture, and then go from there. Right. I mean, basically just be able to open up the program and you have an idea of what you're looking at, create an object, and have an idea of how it's built. Okay. So that right there is going to conclude this lesson, the Crash Course in the Maya. Thanks a lot, everyone.